Yitzhak Rabin's stunning election victory brought the Labour Party back into power. Rabin had promised to accelerate peace talks with the Arabs. I believe that agreement will be reached within less than one year. You can say nine months, less, or between nine and 12. Israel's old enemy, Yasser Arafat, still claimed to lead the Palestinian people. But exiled in Tunis and cut off from his homeland, Arafat was more willing to compromise with the Israelis. In London, in December 1992, a PLO representative from Tunis was on assignment. I had never met an Israeli before, not one. All the way to the meeting, I was looking left and right, and behind me, I was afraid of being seen. The Israeli who initiated the meeting was waiting for him. He was an academic with unofficial connections to Israel's new labor government. It was a moment of truth. Meeting a PLO man was against the law. The Israeli's cover for meeting a member of the PLO was provided by a fellow social scientist from Oslo. I simply suggested that um, Hirschfeld and myself at breakfast, and then uh, that when uh, Abu Allah arrived in the lobby, uh, I should simply discreetly slip away from the table and Abu Allah should take my place. We spoke about the conflict, which had no end in sight. It had been raging for the whole century. So how could we end it? PLO headquarters in Tunis awaited his report. Abu Allah told us what had happened. I said, if they ask you to go again, go. He asked, what's the point of talking to these people? I said, well, there must be something behind it. At the same time, official peace negotiations begun in Madrid continued in Washington where a delegation of West Bank Palestinians were getting nowhere. <laughs> Bypassing the delegation to talk directly to the PLO was thought by some Israelis as a better way around the impasse. But even the PLO did not speak for all Palestinians. The fundamentalist group Hamas had just kidnapped an Israeli police officer and murdered him. We have to take a measure that will speak not by words, but by deeds. Rabin ordered Israeli security forces to round up and deport 415 Hamas activists. The expulsion from the West Bank created a crisis in Washington. If they do uh, deport the Palestinians uh, this morning, then I don't think the Israeli delegation tomorrow morning will find a Palestinian delegation to negotiate with. The public opinion at home was, you know, uh, boiling. It was so volatile that we knew we couldn't proceed with the discussions, with the negotiations. The Palestinian delegation walked out of the Washington talks. Arafat now had no links to the Israelis. He sent for the Norwegian social scientist who had set up the secret breakfast in London. Arafat uh, told me that um, uh, the talks in Washington were completely stuck and that was why he felt there was a need of a back channel and thought that the research institute in Oslo, which I was heading, should be the sort, sort of front organization for the talks because both the PLO and Israel needed deniability for having such talks. The fish was hooked and they were off to Oslo.
We were nearly arrested when we landed. We didn't have visas. Nobody met us. Instead of being treated as VIPs, we were grilled for two hours by the Norwegians. We had to be so careful that we did not even inform the Norwegian secret police about uh, their arrival. Abu Allah, with two fellow Palestinians, was driven through the snow to a country mansion near Oslo. Here, he and the Israeli professor got down to business. I said to Abu Allah, we must focus on topics where agreement is possible. We must put to one side subjects we know we can't resolve. In dispute with the Palestinian territories ruled by Israel, Gaza and the West Bank, and most disputed of all, Jerusalem. I said, we won't agree about Jerusalem. He talked about Palestinian control of the entire West Bank. I said, listen, we won't agree to that. Let's focus on Gaza first. Every Palestinian was suspicious about Gaza first. The Israelis wanted to get rid of Gaza. For them, Gaza was just a factory of problems and the Intifada. Back in Tunis after the first Oslo meeting, Abu Allah voiced his concern about the idea of Gaza first. Abu Mazen said, if any Palestinian land is offered, we should take it. Why reject Gaza? Then Arafat said, I want Jericho as well. I asked him, why Jericho? He said, to get a foothold in the West Bank. Gaza is a dead end, but Jericho leads somewhere. Jerusalem, the Israeli's capital, had always been claimed by the Palestinians as their capital too. The PLO indicated that they now saw the wisdom of deferring their demand. But Israel's prime minister had not yet been told about the Oslo talks. It's pointless talking to Arafat and the PLO. The only Palestinians we deal with are the delegation in Washington. The foreign ministry decided it was time to tell Rabin about the secret back channel. Though skeptical, Rabin thought it could be useful. The Palestinian delegation was still boycotting the Washington talks, and he was determined to force them back to the negotiating table. We had orders for the next session in March. As we left Oslo, we told Abu Allah we wouldn't be coming back unless the Washington talks were resumed. It was an ultimatum. Arafat now had to resuscitate the Washington negotiations. He summoned Hanan Ashrawi and her colleagues to tell them they must go back. He said, we cannot afford to pay the price of walking out. Don't live in your small worlds. You want to be the heroes. You are considering only yourselves. You don't consider the Palestinians, six million Palestinians. You don't consider the peace process. If you don't go, you break the peace process. You break your people. Come on, get down to earth. And he stood up and he left us. He walked on us. So we followed him to the other room. He was so furious. Abu Allah told me later, you really set the cat among the pigeons. Arafat and I had to talk the whole Washington team round. He said, they were all against going back. We couldn't tell them why they had to. We gave them lots of reasons, all completely fictitious. We came back by clear-cut orders from Yasser Arafat. Go! Soon afterwards, Israel's Oslo team brought home a draft which the two sides called a Declaration of Principles. 
They came back very excited and said, we have a draft. It was obviously still rough, but they said, look, the PLO are willing to play ball. But with the Washington talks resumed, Rabin had no further use for the Oslo talks and ordered them suspended. The foreign ministry, desperate to keep them going, placed the Oslo declaration before a lawyer Rabin trusted. I thought that the document was lousy and needed to be started from scratch. I said to him, look, the real breakthrough in Oslo is that the PLO have agreed to go one step at a time. This means that we retain Israeli control. Yossi Belin drove with his boss, Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, to see Rabin. I was squeezed between the two of them. And as we were driving, Yossi Belin whispered into my ear. He said, well, I don't want to put you under too much pressure, but you should know that the entire fate of the uh, Oslo negotiations now uh, is on your shoulders. And with this uh, statement ringing in my ear, we entered Rabin's office. At the beginning, the drafts were uh, very, very bad to Israel. He was uh, suspicious that the PLO was using the Oslo track in order to somehow uh, trick Israel into concessions and then using what was said in Oslo against Israel in Washington. I said, Yitzhak, forget Washington. Maybe the PLO was trying to tell us that they were prepared to be more flexible than the official positions expressed in, in, in Washington. I had my doubts, but I said, go ahead, try. Rabin asked the lawyer to join the talks in Oslo, alongside a top government official appointed to show the PLO that Israel now meant business. Yosef. Joel arrives and starts to cross-examine Abu Allah. I asked them, there are the settlements. I mean, in, in, in the agreement, you wrote that you will have jurisdiction all over the West Bank. This is what, what is written here. Now, what about the settlements? Do you intend to go into the settlements to send your... your uh, tax collectors into the settlement and collect taxes. They said, uh, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. I said, do you intend to use Palestinian teachers to teach the Israeli kids in the settlement schools under Palestinian curricula? They said, no, 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 no. So I said, so you mean that the settlements will not be under your authority. They said, certainly not. I said, okay, not the settlement. Now, as to Jerusalem, will Israel continue to govern Jerusalem? They said, yes. I said, okay, it was not clear in the document. Joel said, let's say we leave your towns. We will have to move our troops somewhere. He said, is it clear that only we can decide where they go and only we can define the security zones? All those questions were really about their security. Even when we discussed the transfer of powers, it was always against the background of security, how they would control security. Everything was about security. And Abu Allah says, yes, as long as you don't make the whole West Bank a security zone. And when they came out of that meeting, Abu Allah came up to me and said, they've turned the Declaration of Principles completely upside down. This is absolutely crazy. We cannot continue like this. But then also he smiled at the end of his, uh, his outburst and he said, but I learned a hell of a lot from those questions. 
At the next session, the lawyer handed back to the Palestinians the Declaration of Principles, with all their verbal concessions spelled out in cold print. I told Singer straight out, you seem to have come with a mission. You are here to destroy the peace process. You're full of hostility to Palestinians. You're living in the past. You have a fear complex. You're still living in the ghetto. You can't make the break and see the way forward. His eyes were shining with anger. And I said, listen, everything that I added, I took from your answers to my question. These are your words. Look at your notes. Next, the Norwegian foreign minister, Jan Holst, accompanied by Terje Larsen, flew to Tunis to visit Arafat. It was now Arafat's turn to raise the stakes. He went into an, um, to a side room and uh, got out a map of um, uh, Gaza, West Bank, and, uh, and uh, Israel, and started pointing at different uh, borderlines that we were discussing. And then, at a certain point of time, he said, and I want kissing points. And uh, I couldn't really... I thought, what does he mean? And I turned to Holst, and I saw that he was completely puzzled. So Holst said, then, uh, you mean crossing points, or checkpoints, maybe? No, 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 said Arafat. I mean kissing points, like... And what he really meant was that it should be a kissing point between Gaza and the West Bank. There had to be an interconnection by way of communication. To my surprise, Arafat now came up with a tougher stance. It did not reflect the current compromise. He asked for a road from Gaza to the West Bank. He revived old PLO demands, which reopened issues we had already agreed to in Oslo. The Palestinian-controlled road between Gaza and the West Bank that Arafat was asking for would cut Israel in two. And now Arafat wanted not just Jericho, but the surrounding district as well. He also insisted that Jerusalem be put back on the agenda. Arafat always thought that if he was getting something, he might as well ask for more. I told Arafat at the end of the meeting, all right, I shall do as you ask, but I know these people. They won't accept it. If we proceed with this line, the Israelis will end the talks. But Arafat insisted on his stand. He said, these are my instructions. They can take it or leave it. Back in Norway, the Palestinian-Israeli relationship was strained by the new demands. Abu Allah, the chief PLO negotiator, presented the new hard line. The Israelis were stunned. I said, gentlemen, you are pulling it all apart, all that you promised, all we negotiated. You know the ground rules we agreed to. But if we take your proposals back to Jerusalem, we can kiss the peace talks goodbye. And I was about to put my things away. Suddenly, Abu Allah asked us to remain seated at the table. He wanted to make a personal announcement. I informed them that I would be resigning. I hoped my brothers in Tunis would continue with Oslo. If they did, I wish my replacement every success. Goodbye, my friends. I will always remember you. We all wondered whether this experienced negotiator was pulling some kind of trick or whether he meant it. Abu Allah walked out into the surrounding woods. He'd hurt his foot, so I got um, a stick for him with a silver handle. So he was walking around 
um, with an air of superiority um, towards the, uh, the uh, Israelis, refusing to talk to them. And then he came over to me and said, it's all over. This was the moment of crisis, when you either pull the plug or do something drastic. We decided to try something drastic. The Israelis had prepared an alternative idea for just such a moment. I said, listen, the fact that we are talking with the PLO will eventually leak out. I think that we should have another agreement in which the PLO undertakes to do a number of things and in return Israel recognizes the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. Um, Singer's point was that if you negotiate with the PLO, you're virtually recognizing them. Recognition was the key. It would put the PLO on the map. Now in Oslo, the moment to raise the issue of recognition had come. The Israeli found Abu Allah in a small drawing room. Abu Allah was leaning on a stick, like this. He raised his eyes to me and I asked him, how are you? And he said, very bad, very bad. I wasn't acting. I was genuinely angry. If you've been negotiating for six or seven months and people suddenly start coming up with new ideas, it's impossible to go on. I said, listen, Abu Allah, if we can't have our modest agreement, let's go for something really big. He looked up and said, what do you mean? Yuri raised the idea of mutual recognition between the PLO and the Israeli government. He dictated some conditions. The main points were that the PLO would recognize Israel's right to exist, renounce terrorism and violence, and change the PLO charter to reflect the new reality. I said, listen, if you persuade Mr. Arafat to accept all these conditions, I promise I'll try to persuade our prime minister and our foreign minister to recognize the PLO. And then these two gentlemen, Uri Sevier and uh, Abuela, came suddenly bursting out of the room, laughing and joking, and um, uh, they had solved the basic problem. It was the breakthrough they were looking for. It seemed the PLO would now become an official partner in the peace process. Who knows? If they will elect me, I will be the president again of the, uh, this Palestinian state. If not, I, will, uh, I, will, I would like to return back to work as a civil engineer. It was now up to Prime Minister Rabin to decide whether to accept the Oslo Agreement. His chief military advisor argued instead for a deal with Syria. I advised him to try for peace with Syria first, and then go to the Palestinians. Peace with Syria would bring the Arab-Israeli conflict to an end. If Syria could be persuaded to sign a peace treaty, its client state, Lebanon, would follow and the Palestinians and Jordan would have little choice but to fall in line. It was in the interest of both us and the Syrians, and it would reduce the Palestinians' scope for haggling. An agreement with Syria will make a positive strategic difference to Israel. An agreement with the Palestinians would just be public relations. Since the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel had occupied a strategic corner of Syria, the Golan Heights, overlooking northern Israel. Successive Israeli leaders had refused to withdraw without peace. We know that Syria would not make a deal with Israel, would not make peace with Israel for less than full withdrawal. 
And of course, for any Israeli prime minister, for Rabin in particular, to, to make the decision to go for full withdrawal was agonizing, was uh, wrenching. But before making the decision, that prime minister had to know what was being given in return, what the Syrian package consisted of. At this moment, a new American Secretary of State came to Jerusalem. We were trying to give some propulsion, some momentum to the uh, uh, track uh, involving the Syrians. Christopher came to meet with Rabin. The four of us came into the room and sat clustered around, uh, in, around the small table. And uh, after some give and take, Rabin suddenly uh, surprised us all with, uh, with a very dramatic gambit. He uh, did give me a very important uh, message to take to uh, uh, Syria, to take to uh, President Assad, and that was, he said, ask Assad if I am able to uh, give him what he needs, will he really go all out for peace? In other words, if Rabin withdrew from the Golan Heights, would President Assad accept alternative ways to safeguard Israel's border? Would Syria agree to full peace, stop support of terrorism from Lebanon, and establish diplomatic and trade relations with Israel? Christopher left the room uh, with the knowledge that uh, I think he, he was holding a, a very significant mandate in his pocket. When he arrived in Damascus, Christopher presented Israel's offer of withdrawal to President Assad. His mistrust of the Israelis was such that he always took every concept and turned it over and looked at it from all different sides, and that's what he was doing with the concept of withdrawal. And he did it by asking me questions, not impolite questions, but very aggressive questions. Now, you have to tell me uh, Mr. Christopher, what the Prime Minister means by withdrawal. That's just an empty term. I really know, know what it means. Christopher then shuttled back to Jerusalem. I met with the uh, uh, Prime Minister again. He was disappointed that uh, uh, Assad had not been more forthcoming, had not shown more appreciation for Rabin's willingness to consider full withdrawal. On almost every detail, uh, there was uh, an essentially negative answer or uh, an answer that suggested that a very protracted process of bargaining would, would have to, uh, to begin. Rabin could not wait for President Assad. He had promised his voters a peace agreement within a year. So he now settled for the deal that was available with the PLO in Oslo. But premature disclosure could ditch the deal and the media were getting close to the story. Is the stage being set for a meeting between yourself and the PLO leadership, perhaps even with Arafat himself? Not in the foreseeable future. Before the next election, at least? I hope not. Rabin had to act fast. He gave the go-ahead to Foreign Minister Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres told me, Yoel, take all your documents, come with me. We're going to conclude the agreement. Peres set off for Scandinavia. To clinch the deal, he needed a smokescreen. He met Norwegian Foreign Minister Johan Holst secretly in Stockholm and asked him to be his mouthpiece in case anyone was listening in as they telephoned Arafat in Tunis. Uh, I called um, Arafat and I got him immediately on the, uh, on the line. And I, to I told him that um, in the code we used at the time, uh, Abu Ammar, which is uh, Arafat's nom de guerre, um, I have uh, the two uh, fathers here. That was the code for foreign ministers. My father and the other father. And he immediately understood what I meant. And I said, and they want to finish everything tonight. We went through the last disputed points, one by one. The phone's loudspeaker was turned on, so all of us could hear Holst on the other end. 
I was listening in for perhaps four or five hours. At around midnight, Shimon Peres went to sleep and he told me if you need my approval, if you want to go beyond the general instructions that we have agreed on with Rabin back at home, wake me up. At issue were the withdrawal of Israel's military government and how and when they would deal with difficult issues like Jerusalem. Twice I had to wake Shimon Peres up. The second and last time he woke Peres up was over the issue of who would control the bridges between the West Bank and Jordan. We wanted to be able to control people entering and exiting from the autonomous areas to see that they are not, uh, you know, concealing weapons and, and, and the like. We wanted the crossing points to be under our control. I said to Holst, tell him we will not retreat from our positions. Tell them if we don't settle it tonight, it might never get settled. We agreed that the crossing points be jointly controlled. It was five o'clock in the morning. After seven hours on the telephone, they finally had an agreement. I think the phone bill was paid by the Swedish government. We still owe them the money. President Clinton agreed to host a signing ceremony. Then, with everyone gathering in Washington and on their way to the White House, Yasser Arafat noticed something missing from the document, the name PLO. He said, I cannot sign this document. I'm the chairman of the PLO, not the head of the Palestinian delegation. And Israel has recognized the PLO. So what are the Israelis up to? Sort it out. Ahmed Tibi rang me. He said, there's a small matter to be sorted out. If it isn't sorted out, the ceremony is off and the chairman is going home. I saw Arafat ordering the plane to be, to, to be ready to leave Washington if they don't accept the PLO. I said, listen, all the documents are printed and ready. It's just an hour before the signing. Less than half an hour before the signing ceremony, Peres called Arafat's representative to his hotel. He suggested that the phrase, the PLO team, be added to the document. I said, I'll ring Arafat. I said to Arafat, Perez says, how about the PLO team? Arafat said, in all of the text? I said, in all the text. He said, okay, two kisses, one for you and one for Perez. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arafat, chairman of the executive council of the Palestine Liberation Organization, his Excellency Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States. The moment I saw Arafat walking out from the White House <laughs> with Rabin next to him and Clinton and so on, imagine this White House that said bye-bye to the PLO, that branded Arafat as a terrorist, Rabin, the chief of staff who occupied the West Bank and Jerusalem, and uh, it was electrifying. Rabin didn't want to look at Arafat. It was terrible. The whole world is watching his body language, and he keeps moving his head not to look at Arafat. And I did not think that they were shake hands. He hesitated a little bit, but I insisted, and I continued stretching my hand to him. 
And then the way President Clinton pulled it, it was evident that wasn't planned. Arafat just wouldn't let go of his hand. He's a great expert at such things. It was a, a moment that be recalled as long as we live, I think. After he finished shaking his hands, Rabin turned to me. He whispered, now it's your turn. He went through this hell, now it was my turn. But the agreement did not bring peace. In the occupied territories, a large number of Palestinians vowed to continue the fight. In Israel, too, the opposition was fierce. We think that this endangers Israel, and what I would do as prime minister is to do anything responsible uh, within the rule of law to stop and nullify the dangers that emanate from this agreement with the PLO to Israel security. What Arafat led now was not quite a state, but for the first time in history, the Palestinians had a government of their own. Among the Arab countries, now Jordan would join Egypt in making a deal with the Israelis. King Hussein was at last able to sign the peace treaty he had wanted. What we have accomplished and what we are committed to is the end of the state of war between Jordan and Israel. But between Syria and Israel, the state of war continued. In an effort to broaden the Middle East peace, President Clinton came to Damascus. President Clinton told President Assad that, well, Rabin presented to you full withdrawal to the line of 4 June, and we expect from you two now to move the next step. Clinton pressed Assad to send his top military commander to meet his Israeli counterpart and work out the practicalities of ending their state of war. It was a big decision for Syria to send our chief of staff for the first time in history to meet the Israeli chief of staff. It's a very heavy and big decision. Assad held back. First, he wanted his ambassador to Washington to meet the Israeli chief of staff. We wore wigs so that we wouldn't be recognized on the El Al flight. We arrived at the meeting place in Washington. Only then could we breathe freely. Take off our wigs. I took a last look at myself in the mirror. Whenever I wear a wig, I look like my mother. The Israeli commander began the meeting by speaking of a military withdrawal without specifying the precise frontier. I insisted that withdrawal has to be to the line of 4 June 1967. I repeat this word more than 20 times during the talk with Barak. Like a parrot, he repeated their demand to withdraw to the June 4th border. The Israeli wanted a more informal exchange. During breaks, we walked in the garden. There, we were off the record. And we uh, spoke, frankly, whether they are committed to settlement with Syria or not, whether they understand what it re requires. On the patio, there were these arched doorways. I compared peace between us to the keystone of the arch. At the end, you feel that he wants to make it. He wants to find a solution. He wants to give his blessing. This encouraging start led Assad to send his chief of staff to join the talks. They discussed military safeguards, 
for example, the future of Israel's early warning station in the Golan. Talks progressed in fits and starts. On the night Syria and Israel agreed to begin a new round of talks, the Israeli peacemakers held a rally in Tel Aviv. We sang, the three of us, the singer Miri Aloni, Yitzhak and myself. Yitzhak and I are not such great singers. He had the words of the peace song on a sheet of paper. After we sang, out of tune, Yitzhak folded it and put it in the pocket of his jacket. On the way to his car, he was shot dead by an Israeli extremist. Three bullets went through his heart and through the song. The government of Israel, with shock and sorrow, announces the death of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who was murdered by an assassin tonight in Tel Aviv. Why? Why have they done this? I am very sad and very shocked for this awful and terrible crime against one of the brave leaders of Israel and the peacemakers. We went to the room where he was lying on the bed. His body was covered with a sheet up to here. On his face was an expression of peace and maybe irony. It was his typical rabbin smile. I kissed his forehead and said goodbye. Peres now became prime minister. President Clinton was determined to see that Rabin's commitment to seeking peace with Syria didn't die with him. The Americans still wanted Israel to keep Rabin's promise to withdraw from the Golan Heights. Rabin had held the Syrian track rather closely to himself. So when he was assassinated, all of a sudden it became very important to pass on to uh, uh, now Prime Minister uh, Perez uh, what had happened and been happening. President Clinton said, here are the promises Yitzhak gave. He asked if these promises committed me. I said, whatever Yitzhak was committed to, I am committed to. Peres asked the Americans to arrange a summit with President Assad so that Peres could repeat his Oslo triumph and bring the negotiations with Syria to a quick conclusion. I told him to ask Assad, do you want to fly high and fast or low and slow? We are ready to fly high and fast in one condition, to know when we land and where we land. President Assad, in my judgment, missed a historic opportunity because he wasn't prepared to take a greater risk for peace. Paris had set a date for the next general election. But then, four days later, Palestinian terrorist attacks changed Israel's political landscape. It was a ferocious blast. The suicide bomber detonated 10 kilos of explosives in the middle of a crowded commuter bus. 24 Israelis were killed. A week later, a Palestinian terrorist planted another bomb on a bus. This time, 19 died. The promises of peace and reconciliation seemed hollow. As new elections approached, many voters cared more about security than peace. These terrorist attacks lost us 20% in the polls. It was catastrophic. I knew another bomb would end the whole thing. The terrorists struck again. In Tel Aviv's busiest shopping street, 14 died and over 100 were injured. Together, the Israeli electorate and Palestinian extremists 
had brought forth a new, more mistrustful Israeli leader. The major decision took place before the elections when I said that I would honor the Oslo Accords, even though I thought they were, they contained many flaws. Nevertheless, Netanyahu agreed to partial Palestinian control of Hebron. But for 18 months afterwards, the peace process was paralyzed. In October 1998, under considerable American pressure, Israelis and Palestinians met in a hotel outside Washington. On the table was a proposal for an Israeli withdrawal from additional territory on the West Bank in return for new security guarantees and the annulment of all clauses in the Palestinian Charter calling for the destruction of Israel. One peacemaker was General Ariel Sharon, whose fierce reputation as a warrior helped provide credibility to the process. Nine days of diplomatic urging, cajoling, intervening and arm twisting by President Clinton finally produced results. This agreement is good for Israel's security. The commitments made by the Palestinians were very strong, as strong as any we have ever seen. We are more secure today because for the first time since the signing of the Oslo Accords, we will see concrete and verifiable commitments carried out. This agreement is good for the political and economic well-being of Palestinians. It significantly expands areas under Palestinian authority to some 40% of the West Bank. We will never go back. We will never leave the peace process, and we will never go back to violence and confrontation. No return to confrontation and violence. To support the agreement, King Hussein left his hospital bed where he was being treated for cancer. He went right to the heart of the matter. We quarrel, we agree, we are friendly, we are not friendly, but we have no right to dictate through irresponsible action or narrow-mindedness the future of our children and their children's children. There has been enough destruction, enough death, enough waste. And it's time that together we occupy a place beyond ourselves, our peoples, that is worthy of them under the sun, the descendants of the children of Abraham. After 50 years of war and suffering, a halting, tentative partition of Palestine was underway. <laughs>